Thank you so much, Donna. Thank you everyone for uh, being here today and allowing me uh, to give this talk. I'm sorry about the little bit of a whiplash. I guess we're taking an all hazards approach to this talk as well as critical care preparedness. Um, I don't have anything to say about COVID-19. I'm sure a lot of you are here to see. I don't have any uh, conflicts of interest to disclose um, financially. I am uh, the chair of the Injury Control and Violence Prevention Committee of the Eastern Association for the Surgery of Trauma. Uh, and uh, my opinions and findings and conclusions don't reflect the views of my employers, affiliated institutions, or other individuals. Uh, just as a warning, some of the images shown during this presentation are graphic and maybe disturbing to some people. My objectives are threefold, identify violence-related injuries as a public health issue, describe critical care preparedness and best practices as mass casualty incidents, explore the role of medicine and medical societies in this area. All right, so does this matter to me? Well, as you can see from this chart, uh, across the world, deaths from terrorist activity uh, is increasing. In the United States, surprisingly, unlike most of the first world, we do have a, as you can see, it's orange, we do have a spike in um, deaths from terrorism. Most of that relates to events that are probably in all of our minds and in the news all the time. Um, probably equal time as the coronavirus. Um, and you can see some of these pictures from the things that we've gone through over the last decade, uh, the mass shootings that have really pervaded our society. As you can see, uh, mass shootings are all throughout the country. Uh, the number of mass shooting events, as, as, in, as well as the number of deaths from mass shooting, are increasing through uh, the time. And so even a surgeon like myself from flyover country in a medium-sized city in the Midwest, uh, we've had to deal with this as well. Uh, about a year ago, we had a workplace-related um, shooting event uh, at Paradigm in Middleton, Wisconsin. And, um, and luckily, the, our, um, our, tra our, our um, mortality was really low. Um, but um, this is something that really should be on the back of everybody's minds. And if not to emphasize it enough, about 15 minutes from here, I had the opportunity to visit this when I was here um, two weeks ago. Uh, the Pulse nightclub, formerly now the Pulse Memorial, uh, where uh, 49 um, innocent people um, lost their lives tragically. As everyone knows, the cost of gun violence in the United States is huge, and the cost of a terrorist attack um, is just incredible. So how do we prepare for this? This is a uh, chart uh, from the Rhode Island uh, Incident Command Center for Rhode Island Hospital. Um, and it's a busy chart, but this is really just to point out there has to be communication within our health systems and inter interaction between the health systems. So it's really important for us as critical care leaders and critical care providers to be at the table. The thing I want to emphasize most, though, today is not that we need to be at the table, but also to remember our ancillary support staff that also need to be at the table. For instance, we can't deal with a mass casualty event unless there's housekeepers that are turning over our rooms as fast as possible. If there's not food preparation for all the people who have to work double shifts and can't go home. So as you plan with your um, hospital, remember all those people that work with you together in an interdis interdisciplinary environment and make sure that they have a voice too because without them, uh, the, the cogs would uh, fall off. So there are some differences in mass casualty incidents from conventional things, such as traffic incidents, uh, which usually have low rates of emergent operative interventions, and violence-related um, mass casualty incidents, which have higher rates of emergent operative interventions. But both really include unexpected surges. And so that's where this idea of triage comes from, and I'm not gonna spend too much time on it because we're running a little bit over time. Uh, but it's this idea that we have to make sure to take care of the people who have the life-threatening uh, problems that we could intervene with as soon as possible and um, provide as much care in a limited resource environment as possible. To do this, however, we do have to over-triage um, pretty severely. Uh, up to about a 50% uh, over-triage rate is acceptable. Uh, in studies of, um, from Israel, they noted that less than half of severely injured patients were identified by experienced trauma surgeons. So in general, we want to err on the side of caution. About 4% of all patients who present after a bombing or a mass casualty event from a blast 
um, will require ICU attention. I know it's about surgical care. Um, just to note, uh, most patients won't go to the operating room right away after a mass shooting. Um, only the people who are immediately life-threatening uh, will go. Um, and when they do go, they'll only have damage control surgeries. And most patients will be in the ICUs or the floors and the EDs, continuing to receive resuscitation, antibiotics, and other care as needed. So triage is an ongoing cycle. We first started on, at, and we really talk about it in the ER and in the field a lot, but the tertiary triage is really important as well. So as ICU physicians, we need to continuously triage our patients, um, and that means that we really need to maximize, maximize live saves with the limited resources. And this can be really counter to what we do often in our ICUs. In terms of surge capacity, we really need three things, space, staff, and supplies. Um, for space, we really need to identify patients um, who can transfer out, um, anticipate needs for uh, their recovery after operations, and identify areas for ICU bed expansion and figure out how we're gonna staff and supply those areas. In terms of staffing, um, in natural disasters, we often lose our communication channels um, because something happened to them. Uh, but often in these mass casualty events in terms of violence, uh, our communication channels will be intentionally turned off. Um, so it's really important to make sure that we have communication channels um, and then make sure that our staff and our, our leadership has up-to-date contact information that everyone, so everyone is reachable. We also have to figure out how to increase staffing and use non-critical care providers um, to care for our patients and uh, offer appropriate oversight. Supply-wise, we can't plan for every mass casualty event, but we really do need to understand the current state of our inventory, and as well as try to um, predict the most likely things that we will need, and also have a plan for rapidly increasing supplies throughout our, the region. Post-incident, we really must review and address all the issues that come up during these events. And then I think a really important part that we miss, we talk a lot about taking care of our patients outside of the ICU, but we also have to figure out what are we gonna do with our uh, providers, our staff, our patients and families who come through and the post-traumatic stress that they go through after events like this. So what else can uh, I or we as a society or a medical profession can do? Uh, SECM, what plug for us uh, is that uh, we have um, courses and books uh, available for disaster management and disaster response planning. The American College of Surgeons puts on the um, advanced, sorry, advanced trauma life support course. And it's really important to try to raise the amount of knowledge in terms of trauma care, uh, because hemorrhage resuscitation and trauma support is slightly different than, than other things that we might be doing in the ICU. So uh, after the Sandy Hook event, um, or the Sandy Hook uh, tragedy, uh, we re quickly recognize that we can't get to people uh, quick enough to save them if they have life-threatening bleeding in an event uh, like that. And so what we identified is that we need to teach uh, the people who are there, the bystanders, how to stop life-threatening bleeding. So this is an initiative that was put together by a uh, group of national um, stakeholders. Uh, today and uh, throughout uh, Critical Care Week, we'll be having Stop the Bleed courses here at SECM, so please stop by. But it's really teaching uh, people who are gonna be there, so that's your relatives, your, your mother, your wife, your children, how to put on a tourniquet, how to apply direct pressure, simple things that they can do to temporize bleeding to stop. Let me shift a little bit to advocacy. So I know we talked a little bit about this um, Sort of, a, or this was mentioned at the plenary. Uh, this is a, uh, a tweet that went out uh, in 2018, about a year ago, by the NRA, and they said, someone should tell self-important anti-gun doctors to stay in their lane. And obviously, appropriately so, the medical community um, was outraged by this because of what we've been seeing and what we've been experiencing, and really um, the lack of concern for a clear public health issue. So my point here is that it's really our responsibility to our patients to go beyond the ICU and to note that policies that are developed at Washington and our state legislatures or even locally in our, our cities and towns, all these policies affect our patients and their health. There are limits to organizations in terms of non, um, 
nonprofit status and things like that in terms of advocacy. But there are things that we can do. I think uh, the East uh, is a great example of what we can do. Um, and the American College of Surgeons has done a wonderful job of coordinating some of this. But really, we really need to look at firearm injury and firearm uh, violence in terms of a research perspective. And at the end of the week on Wednesday during Critical Care Week, um, one of our, our um, leaders in this uh, field, uh, Dr. Marie Crandall, will be giving a little bit of talk describing the different evidence-based practice management guidelines that we've been putting out, as well as consensus statements. So it's really important to go back to the data and uh, think about it as much as possible in terms of addressing um, this issue, this public health issue. So just to conclude, a preparedness for violence-related mass casualty incidents must be um, thought of in terms of a critical care coordination model. And it's really important for you as critical care physicians to become involved within your own community. Thank you.